and we go to screen sharing. Put it here. All right. Obviously, we're talking this week about uh, Samuel Seabury, the first American bishop, and the Scottish Episcopal Church. Uh, just a quick review of the, of the basics of the colonial church in America. Beginning with Jamestown in 1607, the Church of England was present in the founding of most, but not all of the colonies. The Church of England in the colonies was under the authority of the Bishop of London. Thus, anyone in the colonies wishing to be ordained had to take the perilous sea voyage and a return trip back. It also meant that no one in the colonies could be confirmed and no bishop traveled to the colonies. As this cartoon from those times shows, when a bishop for the colonies had been suggested in England, it was never accepted by the Church of England bishops or the crown. After 169 years of colonial rule, the colonists engaged in the Revolutionary War to do an independence. And the Church of England in the United States was greatly affected by this as many clergy and church members were loyalists. In addition, two acts of parliament provided for oaths to be made by an ordinance. First, um, and loyalty to the monarch, and second, the strict use of without change or edit of the official 1662 prayer book, which meant saying prayers for the English monarch at every service. With the signing of the Treaty of Paris in 1785, a large number of the loyalists left for Canada or to return to England or to another English colony. With American independence gained, the English parliament was not willing to provide legislation to make possible the consecration of bishops in the United States. What remained of the Church of England in America understood the pressing need for bishops if the church was to survive the drastic effects of the war. In Virginia, which includes what is now West Virginia, the church was practically dead. The church in Connecticut was far stronger than in any other part of the country, having 14 clergy and 40 congregations. But they realized that without a bishop in the church, the state, uh, the, the state of the church would wither and die. Ten of the 14 clergy met in the Glebe House pictured here in the village of Woodbury in 1783. They first elected a favorite son of the diocese to be bishop, but he refused the election because of reasons of health. And then they elected Samuel Seabury from New York. With no bishops in America to consecrate him, he had to go to England to try to negotiate an agreement to consecrate him. A little bit of background about Samuel Seabury himself. He graduated from Yale in 1748 and studied theology with his father. He then went to Edinburgh to study medicine from 1752 to 1753. He was ordained a deacon on December 21st, 1753, and a priest on December 23rd, 1753. He returned to the United States to serve parishes in New Jersey and then New York. And surprisingly, he was also a leading loyalist in New York City during the war for independence. But after the after independence, he stayed in the US. Following his election, Samuel Seabury headed off to London on July 7, 1783, taking with him a petition to the Archbishop of Canterbury 
asking for consecration as a bishop for Connecticut. Now, John Moore had just become the bishop of Canterbury and Seabury negotiated with the archbishop and his administration for well over a year with no success. Finally, Seabury turned to the Scottish Episcopal Church the Episcopal Church of Scotland, whose roots were in the Celtic tradition rather than the Roman tradition, was not the established church in Scotland, nor part of the Church of England. Though they were legally recognized in Scotland, they were nonetheless an oppressed church. For example, under the penal laws in force at that time, the church could not have a building. The one condition set by the Episcopal Church of Scotland was that Seabury study the Scottish service of Holy Communion, which was based on ancient rites, and to work for adoption of that pattern in the United States rather than adopting the English 1662 book. In Aberdeen on November 14, 1784, Seabury was consecrated by Robert Kilgore, Bishop of Aberdeen and Primus, presiding bishop of Scotland, Arthur Petrie, Bishop of Ross and Moray, and John Skinner, coadjutor Bishop of Aberdeen and rector of St. Andrew's Parish. The consecration took place about 500 meters from the present St. Andrew's Cathedral at Long Acre, which was Bishop Skinner's house where the congregation worshiped. It was a great risk for the Scottish bishop as it was technically against the law for them to do this service. And there was potential for them to be imprisoned or exiled. Seabury's consecration by the Scots caused great alarm for the British government. And as a result, parliament was persuaded to make provision for future foreign ordinations. An unintended positive consequence of Seabury's tenacity made the continued relationship between the Church of England and the American Church a possibility. Seabury returned to Connecticut in 1785 and became the rector of St. James Church in New London, as well as Bishop of the Diocese. And this was a typical arrangement of the time for, for a bishop to be the rector of a parish from which he drew most of his salary. At a reception for Bishop Seabury by the clergy of Connecticut, his letters of consecration were read and they were accepted. The next day, the first Anglican ordinations on American soil were held. The validity of his consecration was recognized by the General Convention of the Church in 1789. In 1792, Seabury joined with Bishop William White, Bishop Samuel Provost, and Bishop James Madison in the consecration of Thomas Claggett as Bishop of Maryland, being the first Episcopal consecration on American soil. On our 2017 pilgrimage, we traveled to Aberdeen from Glasgow, specifically because of Seabury's consecration by the Scottish Church. The next morning, leaving our bed and breakfast, om ominously called the Lost Guest House, we walked through the central city of Aberdeen. It was very gray. Old city, nothing is. We eventually found St. Andrew's Church. The door of the cathedral was locked. We found an alleyway leading to the door of offices in the courtyard. Uh, we were asked to come back later when a volunteer guide would be in the cathedral to show us around. On our return, we discovered that the un unassuming exterior of the church 
was misleading. We discovered a spacious interior that seemed filled with immense pride for their role in helping to establish the Episcopacy in the United States. There are strong ties even now with the Episcopal Church and especially uh, with the, diocese, the uh, Scottish Episcopal Church and the Diocese of Connecticut. And one sees that written large in the very fabric and furnishings of the church. These are in the ceiling. The seals of the diocese of all the dioceses of the Episcopal Church in the United States adorn the ceiling of the church's Church of Scotland. And one of the reasons for that is uh, the their church was enlarged and refurbished with help from the United States benefactors from 1930 to 1938. The cathedral's main altar, altar, interestingly enough, is covered with this canopy called a baldachin, which is usually seen in large Roman Catholic churches and basilicas. It acts as a visual focus being itself a large structure forming a mediation between the enormous scale of the building and the human scale of the people officiating at the altar. The baldachin, tends to be highly decorated as this one is, you can see from this close up. The large stained glass windows show scenes from the life of Jesus. And going from left to right here, it's uh, Jesus' birth, baptism, crucifixion in the center, resurrection and ascension. At the back, an American flag is displayed near the entrance. This is the colors of the American Combat Regiment, which was given to them by uh, General David, Dwight David Eisenhower, uh, which they keep on permanent display. On the back wall of the church is a calligraphy scroll, and scroll in memory of Seabury himself, and it reads, at the close of the American War of Independence in the year 1783, Samuel Seabury, an American priest, was duly elected Bishop of Connecticut. There was no bishop in all of America, and the perpetuation of the church depended upon securing an American episcopate. Dr. Seabury was sent to England to the Archbishop of Canterbury with a petition for consecration, which was refused, owning to the political situation existing at that time. He was invited to Aberdeen, where on 14 November 1784, he was consecrated in the upper room at Long Acre, where the congregation of St. Andrews worshiped during the, first during the period of the penal laws. His consecrators, by their courageous act, incurred the danger of imprisonment or exile. Samuel Seabury thus becoming the first bishop of the American church and the first diocesan bishop of the Anglican communion beyond the sea. After touring St. Andrews, the guide directed us to Marischal College, which is now located on the site that Long, the Long Acre, uh, where the consecration took place. We walked in and not knowing what we we're going, we walked up to the college receptionist and it turns out they get frequent visitors to the quad, mostly Americans and mostly Episcopalians one assumes, to see this commemorative plaque that was placed at the college by the Diocese of Connecticut. So not only is uh, the uh, Scottish Episcopal Church uh, aware of this history, but so, so are all the students at uh, Marischal College. Among other interesting sites we passed in Aberdeen, was the statue of the Gordon Highlanders and this rather imposing statue of Robert the Bruce, King of Scotland, 1306 to 1320. Farther on, we found the Toll Booth Museum, which is one of Aber uh, Aberdeen's oldest buildings and one of the best preserved 17th century jails in Scotland. 
It features displays of local history on the development of punishment of crime through the centuries. Uh, the museum provides a unique experience in the form of 17th and 18th century cells, original doors and barred windows. Nancy toured the museum, as I was warned that the narrow and uneven and steep stairs probably precluded my safety climbing them. Some of the punishments seem, especially against political prisoners portrayed in the exhibits, seemed rather medieval in nature and some outright horrifying. So this is a device to keep a woman from talking too much. It, around her head to keep her tongue depressed. And probably the rest of her as well. The next day, Nancy took a bus to Stonehaven to see Dunatar Castle. The walk from the bus stop was a mile and a half over uneven terrain. Dunatar is the site of fascinating and dramatic events in Scottish British history. And over, to, to summarize, over the centuries, the castle has been burned, rebuilt and burned again. It has been a religious community, a fortress, a terrible prison, and the scene of one of the most famous episodes in the history of Scotland. In the fifth century, the tireless St. Ninian established a church on the rock of Dunatar, one of the earliest Christian sites in Pictland. This early Christian center at Dunatar grew and became incorporated into a fort and a small settlement. In 1276, a new stone church in the Norman style was consecrated for worship atop the rock, most likely on the site of Ninian's first chapel. When Edward I made his bid for the Scottish throne, Dunatar once more became a pawn in the game of kings. The English troops occupied Dunatar, but a Scottish force under William Wallace captured the castle. The English took refuge in the church, but Wallace burned the church with the soldiers inside and destroyed the castle. In 1636, the English were back, 1336, when Robert I died. <laughs> Edward Balliol made a bid for the throne with the aid of English troops. Edward occupied the castle and almost immediately began to strengthen the defenses at Dunatar, including the curtain wall surrounding much of the clifftop site and the stone keep. But the most dramatic event in I skipped a paragraph. Yeah, the, the Scots retook Dunatar and once again it burned to the ground. Okay. We got uh, the most dramatic event in the history of Dunatar uh, was yet to come. Charles II stayed at Dunatar at the beginning of his attempt to wrest the throne from Parliament. He was crowned at Scone in a ceremony that included the honors of Scotland, which is the Scottish equivalent to the crown jewels of England. The honors consist of a court crown, a ceremonial sword, and a scepter. Olive Crom Oliver Cromwell seized Edinburgh, so the honors were sent to Dunatar Castle for safety. Com Cromwell was just determined to destroy the honors as he had destroyed the English crown jewels. The Earl of Marischal was taken prisoner by Cromwell so the defense of Dunatar was entrusted to Sir George Ogilvy. In September of 1651, the English troops appeared at Dunatar and settled down to a long siege. The garrison of 69 men held out through the very long winter. And in May of 1652, English guns began to bombard the castle. For 10 days, they, the guns roared and the number of defenders dwindled. Finally, after a siege lasting eight months, Ogilvy surrendered Dunatar and discovered that the honors of Scotland had already been spirited away. According to legend, under a woman's skirt, 
right under the noses of the English army and was taken to Kenef Church where it remained until the restoration of the monarch in 1660. Though the keep was in ruins and the great hall destroyed, enough remained that the castle could be used as a barracks. In 1685, religious turmoil was at its height with the authorities severely repressing every vestige of Presbyterianism. 167 men and women who refused to accept the new prayer book and acknowledged the king's supremacy in spiritual matters were marched to Dunatar and interred in this damp, dark cellar, which has since become known as the Whigs Vault. There they were kept in dreadfully cramped conditions with no sanitation for five weeks until the end of June. Some of the Whigs relented and took the oath of allegiance. Others tried to escape. 25 managed, but of these 15 were recaptured and the remainder were transported to the West Indies. In 1695, the 9th Earl of Marischal managed to regain Denatar for the East. The 10th Earl of Marischal made a fatal error in judgment when he joined the 1715 Jacobite rebellion, which was doomed from the start. And both James and the Earl had to flee to France. As a result, King George I seized his estates the castle was sold to the York Building Company, which stripped it bare. Many years later, the Keys managed to regain possession of Dunatar, but it was not until 1925 that any serious effort was made to arrest the decay of centuries, and is now a tourist attraction. The nearby town of Stonehaven. Oh, this is the uh, part of the restoration that was done uh, to make it a tourist attraction. The nearby town of Stonehaven has a bit less renown, being the birthplace of the inventor of the pneumatic tire, and a restaurant in in Stonehaven, there claims fame where it could find it. The birthplace of the world famous deep fried Mars bar. Next time we will travel to Iona where much of the monastic work of the conversion of Scotland, England and even Europe to Christianity began. That was wonderful. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Hey, Don, in the beginning, you showed Seabury went to be consecrated as a bishop for the United States, but you showed him with, I think, three other bishops. That yeah. then, yeah. where did those three come from? Okay. Um, you had Bishop White, who mm -hmm. was uh, consecrated for Philadelphia in, in England. Wow. In England. Oh, in oh, England. Oh, in okay. Um, and then uh, after, because what, what happened is Seaburn was the first bishop to be consecrated. And after the Scot consecrated Seabury, the English started thinking this might not be a good idea to totally lose the colonies and, oh. and give them over to those... Uh, those rebels over in okay. Scotland. And so consequently, uh, they agreed. And so they did uh, the consecration for, for White and for um, Mad Madison, I think of his name, um, which then gave you the three bishops that you needed for a consecration in the United States. Okay. Thank gotcha. you. Yeah. So we, uh, we, took, we took these uh, Philadelphia out of out of order from the actual uh, chronological order of the of the events. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, that was interesting. Hi, Nancy's mother. That's her sister. Her sister. No, oh, mother. 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 Oh. Yeah. <laughs> She's very young looking. Yes. 
It's the truth. Me and my sister got those young looking jeans. Oh, I love it. <laughs> this was great. Thank you guys so much. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. You're welcome. Yes, thank you. We look well, forward to the next one. Right. 23rd. The 23rd will be the will be the next one. Um, two weeks. Two weeks. Already. Thank you so much. So do you want to know what they made him do liturgically? Yes. This is fascinating. So in the Eucharistic prayer, there's the calling forth of the Holy Spirit onto the bread and the wine. Mm -hmm. The technical term for that is either the epiclesis or epiclesis, depending on how you say that. Actually, it's depending when, where you were, when you were educated. Yeah. <laughs> that was part of the early church and the Scots had access to some of that documentation and they put that in their liturgy. Oh. Whereas Cramner had put it out under the impact of John Calvin, the sense that it's just a memorial, so you don't call down the Holy Spirit on them. So they essentially traded consecration for the fact that the American church would have that in their Eucharistic praying. Oh, how interesting. Isn't that interesting? Yes. yes. And we retain it. And we keep it. Yeah. That's that's neat. Yeah. How different is the prayer book of Scotland from ours? Is, is it the same? No. No. I didn't think so. Each uh, part of the Anglican Church and each uh, national church uh, controls their own prayer book. Yeah, because we were talking about the uh, and New so Zealand. It has similar traditions. Uh, we borrow from one another, but, and it's a little strange, to my way of thinking, but if a church, say the Church of Canada, puts out a prayer book, we, unless we have specific and unique permission from the bishop, we can't use a, a prayer from another prayer book that isn't from our, really? our, our, our national church. Hmm. Well, how interesting. Yeah, so for instance, the prayers of the people, we have six categories. I think the English church has five. So if you're gonna, and we can write our own prayers of the people. Oh. Right, it's permission right in the prayer book. Oh, okay. So if you take something from an English source, you have to adapt it because you have to have the six categories. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is fascinating. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't use like parts of the New Zealand prayer book, for example, because I, I look at it a lot. We could certainly use the prayers of the people with no problem, but just adapting where necessary. Oh, okay. Very but interesting. In terms of a Eucharistic prayer, I'd have to have Bishop Mike's permission. Oh, now I have to go to my New Zealand prayer book and look at that in comparison to ours. You will find the same piece of parts, I think, or very similar. So Eucharistic prayer is built out of 11 pieces parts. Oh, fascinating. Oh, it's, yeah, anyway. <laughs> I could go on more than I should. We'll let you guys go and not ask you a million questions. Oh, I don't mind. Thank you so much. You're Thank welcome. You. And Don, I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks very much. Thank Bye. you. Bye, Bye John. Bye now. <laughs> Thank you. That was interesting. Hey, Mom, how you doing? You're on uh, mute. My mom left. Oh, there you are. You're on mute, Mom, so I can't hear a word you're saying. <laughs>
<laughs> Call it. There we go. Now you can hear me. There we I are. I can hear you. You're back in Kyoto, Mom. Yeah. <laughs> I had uh, the furnace guy came to check my furnace out for the winter. Uh huh. And when he was uh, going out to figure out how much the a new filter cost and stuff like that, he turned around and he said to me, "Are you qualified for senior discount?" I got a real chuckle out of that one. <laughs> I bet you did. <laughs> I'm 86. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was funny. That was good. So I enjoyed your little speech there, Don. It was oh, thank very you. interesting. You guys saw lots of really neat things when you were away. We certainly did. It was uh, fascinating. I mean, we missed tons of stuff too, you know? It's kind of uh, interesting having to realize, okay, I'm not a tourist. I came here to see this, this, and this. Yeah. I got the nicest scones from that little village, Stonehaven. <laughs> I brought some back. Mm -hmm. It was quite a walk. Yeah. <laughs> right along the cliff. It was beautiful. That looks it. Well, I'll let you go. And uh, thanks a lot. We'll see you on the 23rd. Okay. Love you. Bye. 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 And